introduction, Hans. Hello, everyone. This is Jolly Tosun speaking from the Institute of Political Science based at uh, Heidelberg University, Germany. Uh, I feel very, very honored to be able to talk to uh, such an international audience here and uh, to familiarize you with um, a, a recent edited book ball, uh, project, uh, which is called Energy Policymaking in the EU Building the Agenda, which is also the title of today's presentation. And uh, uh, I will kind of familiarize you a bit with what we wanted to do in this book and uh, give you an overview of policy making in the European Union, but also more specifically with regard to energy issues. So um, effectively, I, I thought just to break the ice a little bit, I should use um, a graphical summary of what, we, what this topic is going to be about. So on the upper uh, side of the slide, you see um, um, a large uh, electricity generation plant, which is based in my hometown of Mannheim. And uh, this is just one example for uh, many ways how electricity or energy is produced in the European Union and elsewhere. And I'm interested in how policy address energy-related issues, but also at the same time how the decisions taken by policymakers affect how energy is produced, distributed, and consumed. So this is effectively um, a very concise, a very dense summary of, of our today's topic. So the structure of the presentation looks as follows. First of all, I will give you um, uh, a more detailed introduction into, um, into today's topic, which involves an overview of the key concepts I'm uh, talking about, what uh, agenda shaping in the EU is effectively about. Then I will give you a little bit background information on energy policy, um, not in the EU context in general, but more, 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 uh, more generically. And then um, I will outline the research questions that we address in the edited volume and to which I will turn um, at the end of this presentation when we turn to the conclusion. But in between that, we will talk about the development of EU energy policy, about EU politics to provide you a solid background of, of what we are doing here, then um, the dynamics of energy policy making in the EU, and uh, well, before we draw a conclusion, I thought it would be worth to familiarize you with the findings we, um, we obtained in the process of putting together the book. So this is uh, what, we, uh, what we had to, um, what, we, what we're heading to, and I think we just dive right into the presentation. So um, as an introduction, I think it's always useful uh, to define key concepts. And I'm not so sure how familiar most of you are with the, with the key term I'm going to use today in, in Mary Variations, actually, which uh, happens to be agendas. Um, more specifically, we will be talking about political agendas, which refer to the set of issues that are the subject of decision making and debate within a given political system at any one time. That's a definition which can be traced back to uh, Frank Baumgartner, um, published in 2001. So um, perhaps this might uh, sound to you like a very trivial process in a way. Um, like, of course, there are many issues out there, and they all kind of receive some attention, some more, some less. So why should we really worry about this? Why, why should this be worth analyzing? So um, there are a couple of uh, points we need to bear in mind, which kind of already um, provide an answer to my question here. So first of all, there is a huge number of issues or social problems. And policymakers, um, as any other um, individuals, uh, face constraints in terms of resources. They cannot commit all their um, attention to this one topic um, or all topics that are out there, but they must prioritize. So um, what kind of matters in this context is like how much political attention is given to um, a different set of social problems. And if uh, political attention is not given to a sufficient degree to a certain problem, then it's not taken up in the policy process, and then um, no further policy action can take place. So um, it is important uh, from a perspective of political steering that we manage to get some attention to social problems so that a policy process can start. And this is essentially what the agenda setting process is about. So. Um, 
as just continuing, we should be a bit more specific about like uh, the, the two kinds of political agendas we are dealing with today, but also more generally. The first one is called the discussion agenda. It's, it's a broader agenda and it involves all kinds of issues which are debated in society, usually consisting of rather broad concepts and ideas. So when I'm talking about discussion agenda, I mostly refer to um, news in the media about public public debates, um, about uh, anything people could, uh, could express their views on, and also digital media, of course, as we are just experiencing today. The decision agenda, that's kind of the, the second component of what, what, uh, what defines a political agenda, is more restricted. It consists of well-defined issues. There we already have a, a key difference um, if we compare it to the discussion agenda. And these issues are up for serious consideration by decision makers. And uh, well, some decision agendas are very restrictive, others are broader, but they all have in common that um, issues that are on this agenda are seriously consulted for, um, for being addressed in form of a public policy response. The decision agenda is motivated and influenced by the discussion agenda, um, so we do have um, a relationship between these two agendas. But uh, we should also keep in mind that it's, there's not just one political agenda and not just one discussion agenda or one decision agenda. There are several ones. So for example, um, if you live in a federal system, like in Germany, for instance, you don't have um, a political agenda only at the federal level, but also at the level of the 16 states. Then you can have discussion or decision agendas at the local level. So there are actually many, many agendas out there. And the fact that we do have many agendas actually can also constrain um, the possibilities issues have to, to be placed on the agenda at, at another level. So the relationship between agendas is really complicated to, to put it, uh, to make it short here. I tried to summarize um, the, the, the main, um, like the, the essence of, of what, what I just tried to explain to you with this graph. So the starting point of any um, agenda setting process is that we have a so-called universe of problems. In this illustration, the universe of problems consists of the elements A, B, uh, D, E, F, and G. And uh, from this universe of problems, only some problems receive attention from the public. So let's say in this particular case, only problems A, F, and G are taken up by the public and are discussed by the media. And so these are the elements that form the discussion agenda. And then in the next step, from out of these three elements that form the discussion agenda, another selection is made, which uh, eventually just contains the elements A and F. And that is uh, kind of what constitutes the so-called decision-making agenda, or decision agenda, as I have put it here. So you can see we start with a wide range of problems in the beginning. And the further we move along the, the, um, the agenda-making process, the smaller the set of problems uh, become that are principally addressed by decision-makers. And then I have inserted two question marks here where you also see the two errors. So analytically, it is, of course, interesting to understand how the issues that constitute the, the universe of problems are selected to be placed on the discussion agenda. And then in the next step, it is also analytically very interesting to understand how the problems that are on the discussion agenda finally enter the decision agenda. And this is what this class today is effectively about for the specific case of energy policy in the European Union. So agenda shaping, um, and I will say something about this word, uh, this term uh, in, a, in a moment, can be conceived as a bottleneck for subsequent policy making. So an issue that does not make it onto the political agenda does not have any chances to end up on, um, on, um, on a list of issues that policymakers seriously deal with in an attempt to come up with a policy response. So put in this way, the agenda phase is really the most important and the most consequential stage in the so-called policy process. 
they are generally free forms of agenda shaping. So um, the last few slides, I always use the term agenda setting, which is usually the specification of agenda shaping, which is most popularly addressed in the research literature. Um, but effectively, uh, agenda setting is just a subcategory of the more generic uh, process of agenda shaping, at least according to Jonas Talberg in a paper which he published in 2003. And it refers to um, the, the, um, the process of placing an existing or a new issue on the political agenda. So this is usually also the, the form of agenda shaping which is most easy to observe and therefore we can see that there is a lot of scientific attention that focuses on this specific type of agenda shaping. The second form of agenda shaping refers to agenda structuring. It is about emphasizing or de-emphasizing issues that are already on the agenda. So by um, increasing or reducing attention that uh, the public pays to them or policymakers. And another very powerful form of agenda shaping refers to um, the agenda exclusion, which is about the active barring of issues from the political agenda. So this is when actors have the power to keep issues off the agenda so that, that no policy process can actually start. Um, as you can imagine, agenda exclusion is really difficult to observe empirically. And that's the reason why um, the, the research literature in generally does not have much to say on the empirical characteristics of agenda exclusion. We know that this has happened, but this is mostly anecdotal evidence. And um, looking forward for future research, um, I think focusing on the power of agenda exclusion is certainly worth uh, to be explored in greater detail. Um, now let's turn uh, more specifically to the topic of agenda shaping in the European Union. So um, the European Union has a unique political system, which is um, on the one hand um, useful for agenda setting processes. I will return to this point later on. But then at the same time, it is also challenging. This is so for two reasons. Um, so as I just explained to you, agenda setting or agenda shaping, to be uh, more precise here, since we effectively uh, should keep in mind that there are three uh, uh, types of agenda shaping. So agenda shaping is it, the, the very bottom line of the agenda shaping process is that we want to gain attention for certain social problems while ignoring other ones. And uh, national governments uh, in the European context first need to be convinced that the EU is really the right place uh, for a, a policy solution to be elaborated. So it is not only that um, we must attain uh, attention, that we must draw attention to a certain problem, but in a second step, we also must make a very credible case that the, the EU is the right level uh, where a policy solution should be uh, worked out. Successful agenda shaping, as we define it in the book, uh, refers to a process that culminates in the adoption of binding or non-binding rules by the EU legislative origins. So uh, these can be regulations, directives, decisions. And uh, unsuccessful agenda shaping refers to a process where no rules are adopted by the EU organs. Um, I think there is a mistake in the, in the slides here because the recommendations and the opinions are also non-binding rules, so please uh, move them up when you, when you take notes um, based on this, on this presentation. So um, again, uh, providing a few more details on the agenda shaping process in the EU context. Of course, um, states and the EU institutions are the uh, are the dominant actors here. They also must be uh, for the because of the first point I mentioned about the fact that we that we always must make a credible claim that the EU is is um, is in charge of regulating of um, or uh, in in charge of producing public policy. But we do also have a mediating role of so-called epistemic communities. These are group of scientists that share um, same uh, normative. Um, beliefs. We also have um, non-state actors such as non-governmental organizations, we have citizens, um, but um, as I just said, their role is more mediating, more flanking. It's not that they are the key actors in the agenda shaping process at the European level. 
And uh, what we should also take in uh, mind is that when we talk about the European Union, there is not an immediate link between the discussion agenda and the decision agenda. But that has to do with the fact that we don't have a European public as much as we have national publics. So for example, we don't have a European newspaper. We have national newspapers where we can see um, what, what the national public debate looks like. But at the European level, this is much more complicated. So the link between the discussion agenda and the decision agenda should be weaker than in the national context. And uh, the thing is also that because uh, the EU is an artificial construct, some say um, the EU is a political system sui generis, it has some very specific characteristics, uh, therefore it needs to legitimize itself quite often. And uh, because of this need to legitimize itself and the actions taken or non-actions, um, it's very, um, the, the EU always feels under pressure to document what it's doing. And uh, so um, it is actually a, a good case for studying whether agenda shaping has effectively led to a policy outcome or not. So therefore, it is a very instructive case for the purpose. Now uh, we should talk a little bit more about the field of energy policy. Um, I would think that most of you are mostly interested in the energy policy component of the presentation. And policy um, in, in, with regard to energy issues has one very important characteristic, which refers to its boundary spanning nature. So energy policy is not only about energy issues, but it has uh, many implications or is affected by decisions taken in the domains of economic policy, environmental policy, security policy, or more generally international relations, and as I will also argue later on, social policy. Therefore, um, this particular policy field provides many more interesting insights uh, than other uh, policy areas for which uh, we have policy activities at the European level. The fact that it is a so-called boundary-spanning policy field um, also means that a large number of actors are involved uh, in energy policy. And they come from different sectors. So some have a more economic background, others have an environmental background or, or a security background. And so this kind of indicates that um, we should observe a wide range of strategies that these different actor groups use. The third point to make about um, energy policy is that it is a very dynamic field. It, it has become, this was not always the case, but it has become subject to intense public and political debate. So if you just think back of uh, what the Fukushima incident uh, started in Germany, the, the nuclear power phase out, for example, this had to do with the uh, intense uh, public debate or um, controversy about the use of nuclear power, for instance. And so um, what we are currently observing in Germany, um, a, a complete transformation of energy production and consumption. This, uh, this is kind of very indicative of uh, the fact that this is a dynamic field where we have uh, a public which pays attention to ta decisions taken with regard to energy policy, and then also policymakers that respond to public demands with regard to energy supply and consumption. And um, the energy policy has also um, experienced a quite remarkable development in the European Union, both internally and externally. So we can see that um, with regard to the internal dimension, the number of laws that address uh, energy issues has grown over time. Um, and what is perhaps even more remarkable is that today the European Union is actually influencing countries that are not even members of the European states by means of an international organization which is called the energy community. And uh, what the energy community effectively does is to um, help third states to import EU energy policies, which is quite remarkable that the EU has managed to, um, to become a role model with regard to energy issues. And so um, I think altogether we can say that um, energy policy in the European context is, is quite a success story. 
Now we turn to the research questions that we uh, pose in the book. So the first research question is, when are energy issues likely to be placed on the political agenda of the European Union? Please bear in mind that, again, this includes the discussion and the decision agenda. Then the second research question is about the actors um, and their influence in agenda shaping and what strategies they use. And the third research question is, when does agenda shaping lead to legislative action? So let's take a quick look at the development of EU energy policy. Um, I have just uh, two minutes ago stated that EU energy policy is a success story. In the very beginning, this uh, was not the most likely outcome. So back in the 1960s, um, the European community was very hesitant to produce law, um, harmonized laws on energy issues. We had um, an external driver that the supply crisis that um, induced the community to adopt legislation specifying the level of emergency oil stocks. But then in the 1970s and early 1980s, not much happened. Things changed uh, with the entering into force of the Single European Act, which uh, provided the legal basis for um, the liberalization of the EU energy market and also by means of institutionalizing EU energy uh, environmental policy, um, the European Commission could use the link between energy policy and environmental policy to propose legislation. So this, this was a very, very important tool that was given to the European Commission to promote um, law projection with regard to energy policy. Then, of course, the Treaty of the European Union was a milestone with regard to policy integration and also the adoption of free packages of directives to liberalize the energy market in 1996, 2003, and 2007 really pushed uh, the integration um, of the European countries with regard to energy policy. So um, beginning in the year 2000, there were quite a number of very important events that took place, which again helped to promote EU energy policy. First of all, with the Eastern enlargement and the increase in secured energy security concerns. Um, so you, you should know that um, quite a number of the new member states of the European Union were uh, or are still dependent on energy supplies from Russia. And so this, uh, the fact that and quite a number of new countries entered the European Union that that were extremely dependent on, on external energy resources um, helped to bring the issue of uh, security of supply on the political agenda again. And uh, that actually led to a greater willingness of the member states to strengthen the Commission's role in securing energy supply. So this was, this was a very useful um, development there. But then also the fact that the European Union um, is very eager to promote global climate governance and is, is really pushing for, uh, for, uh, for climate uh, legislation and climate activity um, helped to, um, to push the energy policy agenda at the European level. So uh, many, uh, many pieces uh, with regard to EU energy policy have um, consequences for climate governance and therefore the, the, the political commitment to combating climate change really helped to promote EU energy policy. And finally, and I think with regard to EU energy policy, this is the most important milestone, the Lisbon Treaty um, of 2009 introduced for the very first time an energy title to the EU treaty framework, which now provides uh, the legal basis for any energy-related uh, policy activity. Before we can talk uh, more specifically about uh, agenda shaping, we should uh, bear in mind a few characteristics of EU politics. So first of all, the EU is characterized by horizontal and vertical power division. And what we also have is we have multiple institutional access points. So we have uh, a number of different EU institutions, which I will um, introduce uh, shortly. And uh, what we also have is that even if we cannot <clears throat> use the European level as, um, as the point of entry for energy-related interests, we can still lobby individual member states um, to uh, 
make an attempt to place certain energy issues on the political agenda of the European Union. And this is something which is very important when we talk about agenda shaping processes in the European Union. Agenda shaping in the EU context can happen in two uh, ways. So one of them is the so-called high politics road. It is about top elites and decision makers uh, proposing which issues should be placed on the political agenda. But it can also happen uh, through the so-called low politics route. So we have bureaucrats who have um, a very profound technical knowledge of things. And they propose um, certain issues to be excluded, to be included on the political agenda, because they they need to be addressed at the European level. So both both uh, roads, both uh, possibilities, are uh, feasible in the European context. And the institutional setup of the EU is the reason why it's absolutely worth studying agenda shaping processes. This is uh, another graph which. Um, introduces the, the main institutions uh, in the European Union. We have the European uh, Commission as the, as the organization that has the formal agenda setting power. So the Commission is the, the institution that must, uh, that must propose legislation because otherwise an issue will not be included on the decision making agenda. Then we have the Council of the EU as one of the two legislating organs and the European Parliament. And as you can see, these three um, organs form the decision makers. Then we have the European Council, which provides policy guidance, um, at least officially. But as we will see during this presentation, the European Council has become quite influential in defining the energy agenda in the European Union. Then we have the European Court of Justice. Um, and on top of this, we have two advisory organs, the Economic and Social Committee and the Committee of the Reason, uh, Regions. But we will not talk about um, the, uh, the Economic and Social Committee and the Committee of the Regions uh, on the next slide, simply because they are not that relevant for energy policy making. The European Council just became formalized in 2009. It consists of the heads of state. Um, it has a president, uh, which is uh, currently Donald Tusk, um, and it also comprises the president of the European Commission, who is Jean-Claude Juncker, and um, the high representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security is also part of the European Council, who happens to be Federica Mogherini. So uh, the European Council, even though it's uh, assigned a role as um, as a, as a guiding organ, has an effective agenda setting power via the high politics route. This is something we can confirm on the basis of our research project. The European Council consists of the governments of the member states. There is a council presidency that rotates every six uh, months. Currently, the council presidency is uh, held by Luxembourg. It meets in different configurations. And there's also um, a, an administrative component, a bureaucratic component to the Council of the European Union, the Coreper, which also explains why the uh, Council of the European Union um, can also use this, the, the low politics route that I have just introduced a couple of minutes ago. The European Parliament is the only EU organ that is legitimized by direct elections. The president of the European Parliament is currently Martin Schulz. And, um, well, there is a debate in the literature about whether the European Parliament really has an agenda shaping power. Um, I think we, I can say that the scholars tend to agree that the power has increased with the extension of the co-decision powers given to it. But the parliament is more involved in decision making than in agenda shaping. So um, if, if we wanted to, uh, like, characterize its, its agenda shaping powers, it would be more one with regard to agenda structuring rather than setting. The European Court of Justice, in, in marked con uh, contrast, has a very direct agenda setting power. It interprets EU law. And uh, there have been quite a number of very influential decisions uh, that put energy-related issues on the political agenda. And then uh, the European Commission, with its commissioners, um, as the formal agenda setter, the organ that has the monopoly of proposing 
um, policy proposals. And uh, I think uh, there is not much debate about this. This is totally uncontroversial in the literature that the European Commission is the main agenda setter in the European Union and that it is also the only um, EU institution that has uh, the power to exclude issues from the political agenda. So the European Commission has a, a specific role in the overall institutional setup. And finally, um, and this is also something which was just created by the Lisbon uh, Treaty, um, the European Citizens Initiative. So uh, now um, citizens can request the Commission to start to propose um, legislation if they manage to bring together one million signatures from a number of uh, countries. And this instrument was actually also used in the past for energy purposes. For example, there was uh, an initiative which failed because it could not, um, it could not meet the formal requirements, which uh, demanded the suspension of the 2009 EU climate and energy package. And it was very much uh, supported by uh, politicians in Poland. But then there are also um, quite a number of other EU um, citizens initiatives where non-governmental organizations get involved. So uh, this new instrument in principle um, gives agenda setting power to the citizens and non-state actors, but it was not used so often uh, that far. And analytically, our understanding is still limited. So um, therefore, I would also encourage more research um, on the European Citizens Initiative to um, better understand agenda uh, shaping processes in the European Union. So now we can uh, draw an interim conclusion which uh, looks as follows. We, can, uh, we, should, um, we should remember that the European Commission is the formal agenda shaper among all EU institutions, being the only institution that has both agenda sh setting and agenda exclusion powers. Um, the agenda shaping activities are co-determined by institutional rules and the preference of the other players. We must keep this in mind. And what is also very important with the uh, formalization of the European Council, the European Commission has ceased to be the only agenda shaper in the European Union, but we ha rather have a situation where uh, we have the European Council that also makes increasing use of its agenda setting powers. And so Bouquillon and Dobbles, um, in an article published in 2014, speak of competitive cooperation with regard to energy agenda setting. Now let's turn to, um, to the edited volume, which uh, forms the foundation of this presentation. I hope you, you enjoy the, the, color, the colorful um, cover of it. And the book consists of uh, four parts in total. Uh, the first part is dedicated to the patterns of agenda building and legislative activities. The second part um, pays specific attention to the commission as a policy entrepreneur. And this makes sense when you kind of remember uh, which important role the European Commission plays with regard to agenda shaping. But then we also turn to um, the role of influential member states. And in part four, uh, we talk about um, the, the most important strategy used for the purpose of agenda shaping, which refers to framing and reframing of issues. So for the table and contents, and of course also for uh, obtaining the, the chapters, please consult the corresponding uh, website of uh, Springer International. Let's uh, review the findings uh, we present in the book. With regard to agenda building and legislative activities, um, we can say that um, overall political attention to energy related issues was initially very limited but has been growing over time. And now I would like to take advantage and announce uh, next week's webinar with uh, my colleague Sophie Biesenbender, who will talk a bit more about this specific aspect. Then uh, it's also important uh, to stress that EU energy policy is influenced both by regulatory legacies in political institutions, but also external events or factors. So there were a number of crises that, um, that very much helped to put issues on the European agenda. 
Then uh, the EU shows the ability to place energy issues on the political agenda of third parties. Um, I already talked about this uh, in the introductory part with regard to the European energy community. And uh, this has also a lot to do with um, how it frames energy policies. So even beyond the energy community, the EU has been successful in uh, proposing um, energy legislation uh, at an international level, uh, which had implications for climate change. So draw, managing to, to highlight the connection between energy and climate change seems to be a successful framing strategy for the EU to uh, put energy issues on the international agenda. This is something uh, we should keep in mind. And more generally, climate change in the last few years has helped a lot to bring new energy issues on the political agenda. The agenda shaping process in general is dominated by the European Commission, but then, as I just uh, said, also by the European Council. And uh, in fact, the mentioning of issues in the concluding uh, documents of the European Council often leads to um, to a new policy process, so where the Commission um, proposes a legal act, which is then uh, discussed with the Council of the EU and the European Parliament. So um, statements by the European Council can be seen as policy consequential in the uh, domain of energy policy. The, uh, the Commission has uh, proven to be a quite active policy entrepreneur. The Commission was very, very uh, active with regard to the market liberalization, so it was the actor that actually brought this issue um, on the political agenda of the EU. But not all agenda shaping efforts by the Commission are successful. So, uh, for example, um, there in a, a few years ago, there were some efforts by the European Commission to um, bring the issue of energy poverty on the political agenda, and also to um, to propose legislation which would which would uh, regulate this issue, but that failed. And also, um, there were some more ambitious uh, initiatives with regard to the use of energy uh, renewable energy sources, and these were also um, not successful. Um, so the, the problem the Commission fails is, uh, the problem the, the Commission faces is that um, it must promote two conf conflicting goals. So on the one side, it's energy, it's the security um, of energy supply, and on the other side, it's um, environmental protection and climate change. And this kind of reduces the power of the Commission, or has reduced the power of the Commission in the future to be even more influential in agenda shaping. Part three uh, highlights the influence the United Kingdom had with regard to the liberalization of the EU's internal energy market. And then also Germany um, was very successful in promoting uh, renewable energy uh, sources. The feed-in tariffs, for example, are the, the most prominent example. And finally, um, Framing and reframing were shown to be the most important instruments used by any uh, actor that seeks to shape the political agenda of the European Union. So um, it's the main strategy of the European Commission. For example, with regard to the third gas directive, it has uh, made a very compelling case about the um, uh, about the uh, dependence of the Eastern European countries on um, energy supply from, the, from Russia, and so it could place this policy initiative on the agenda. But then uh, also with regard to framing, for example, um, framing and reframing has been very important. Framing, as it was um, as it was framed by the European Council, was had very much to do with the issue of energy security. And uh, energy security was also the dominant uh, aspect of the proposal originally um, prepared by the European Commission. But then once the European Parliament entered the policy process, um, the issue was reframed to highlight the potential health and environmental uh, risks that uh, that hydrological fracturing could bear. And so um, these are these are like the, the, these two are the most important strategies for any agenda shaping process, and I, I, I would invite you to keep this in mind. Now we turn to the conclusion, so we can say that in the last few years, energy issues did benefit a lot from elevated levels of political attention. 
and, and this is reflected in an increased production of corresponding energy policy. EU energy policy has become more diverse and encompassing, now also including considerations about the affordability of energy. And if we turn more specifically to the free research questions that I presented to you earlier, um, we can say that framing and reframing matter. Um, so these are kind of um, very important factors for, for answering the first question. And also the strategy ad adopted by the key players, and most importantly here, the European Commission and the European Council matter. Then turning to the second question about which actors are influential in agenda shaping and what their strategies are, we can say that, um, again, the Commission and the European Council dominate, but also the member states, some of them at least. Um, this particularly holds true for Germany with regard to renewable energy, but also the United Kingdom, which very much pushed for the uh, liberalization of the internal energy market. And uh, when we turn to the third research question um, about when agenda shaping leads to legislative action, we can again uh, point out that framing and reframing matters, but what also matters is the support by the member states. For example, um, with regard to um, energy poverty, the problem there was that there was not a single member state that really embraced the, the, the proposal by the European Commission that um, the social dimension of energy production and consumption should also be placed on the political agenda. So support by at least a few member states seems to be crucial for um, any agenda shaping effort to become successful. Now you can uh, see here, this is my, uh, my closing picture. When agenda shaping is successful, um, Usually new energy projects are launched, uh, which makes uh, decision makers very happy. As you can see here, this is the inauguration of the Nord Stream project. And, uh, and for any um, further progress with regard to energy policy, agenda shaping is extremely important. And therefore, um, I would make a plea that we all pay more attention to this stage in the policy cycle and also come up with more um, innovative and intriguing concepts for addressing it and more empirical evidence, of course. This is the literature I used for this presentation. Uh, feel free to approach me if, if you don't have access to any of these titles. And this would be it from my side. I thank you very much for your attention. And now I look forward to the Q&A. And um, I hand it back to you, Hans.